We're in a time in our church um, that is typically called stewardship. And usually when people talk about stewardship, um, the idea that usually comes to their mind pretty quickly is something about money. And one of the things that I wanted to kind of highlight for you is for the last couple of weeks, what I've been trying to do is trying to give you some idea that stewardship is really about how do you perceive the church and your role in it, not just financially, but in its totality. How do you perceive what we do? And, and stewardship typically happens during the fall season. And one of the reasons for that is, is right now, if you kind of go out and about, you're noticing that a lot of trees are beginning to change color. If you, if you know what happens is during the summer, uh, the trees have, are filled with chlorophyll. It's, it gives it that green color. Uh, with the onset of fall, that chlorophyll leaves the leaf and, and the natural colors begin to be revealed. Things that have been there over the summer, that color begins to be revealed. And so during the time of stewardship, the purpose is really to, to reveal what is it you really believe, not just what you say, but what is it you really believe about the church. See, people have different metaphors or different ways of relating to the church, how we interact together. For example, some people perceive that the relationship that you and I have is that of theater and performance. That is, that you expect on a Sunday morning that you come in and you want to hear something encouraging or you want to hear something challenging. You want to you say that this was a good hour spent. You want to hear good music. You want to feel uplifted or energized or something like that so that when you leave, you feel good about who you are or the path that you're on. If you don't, if you kind of go, well, I really didn't get a lot out of that, you might decide to start shopping around for better, better entertainment. You see our relationship. But the church was originally created in order that we together might take all of our experiences, our background, our history, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and combine it together in a sense of worshiping who God is. That God could show the world that through our unity, all of this diversity of, of experiences, of backgrounds could come together. We could actually work together in harmony for something good, that we work together. We talk about that in terms of becoming the body of Christ. But a lot of times people will have another metaphor. It goes something like this, that when you become part of the church or you become a member of the church, that you have somehow purchased a ticket and that ticket will get you into heaven. That someday in the sweet by and by, when we all get to heaven, what a glorious day that will be. And you'll be able to hand in your golden ticket that you got from the Willy Wonka chocolate factory. And you'll be able to hand that in and say, see, I get in free because I'm a member, right? A and that will usher you in. Now, the thing about the ticket though, is that if you can, you can find that people that believe in this metaphor because they tend to be uh, people that will show up Christmas and Easter, right? Why, why show up anymore? I mean, you, you already have your ticket. Why, why get involved? You're already going on to the sweet by and by. And so they have this ticket. And one of the things that often comes from that as a result of having this idea is it's difficult then to get these kind of people involved. And you can check and figure out where you are in your relationship with God. For example, um, you would know, are you currently involved in some ministry? 
Are you actively involved in participating in the life of the church, or do you kind of take it as a come and see and figure out how it goes? Well, there's different ways of relating, and what stewardship really does is it tries to bring you to a conclusion of saying, this is what you really do. This is who you are. And so this morning, I wanted us to think about your relationship. What is it that you truly believe? Not just what you say, but what you live out. If you have, we've tried to mail out our stewardship cards, and I hope that everybody has received both the card and the magnet that helps, helps you focus on, on what you believe. And my purpose in doing that, I've sent that to both members and non-members as well because I want everybody to have an opportunity. And what I want you to understand is this is an invitation to you. I am not going to look at these. I'm not going to collect them back and have them on my desk. This is about who you are. We're asking you on the 1st of November. 1st of November will be All Saints Sunday. It'll be communion. We're going to ask you to come forward and, and take your commitment and say, God, this is what I believe. This is who I am. Regardless of what's happening around, this is what you can count on me. There came a point in your life, if you are a member, and I would, again, I want to try and change that language. If you became a partner, there was a time when you stood up in front of the community and you said, I make this vow to participate fully with my prayers, my presence, my gifts, and my service. And so what I want to be able to do is just, how's that going for you? How many of you have ever heard of this organization called Weight Watchers? Do, do you know how that works? Do you know the principle behind it? Basically, this is how it works. And there's a group that meets here on Monday morning. This is how it works. You have decided in, in some way, you say, there's something I need in my life. I need to lose weight. I want to lose weight, but it's hard for me. It means I have to watch what I eat, and it means I have to exercise, and, and that's hard. So I need an accountability group. I, I pay people to hold me accountable, to check in on me. So every Monday they gather and they say, how are you doing? Uh, here's a plan. Here's how you can lose the weight that you want to lose, but you've got to follow this plan. And so they check in on you every so often. Now imagine coming in on Monday morning and they say, this is the worst program ever. I have been a part of this program for the last two years and I haven't lost any weight at as a matter of fact, I'm gaining weight as a result of being on this program. Shake their head and they say, well, okay, let, let, let's work on this. Um, are, here's the eating, are, are you following the eating plan? Well, no, I'm not following, that's, that's hard. I don't wanna give up, I mean, there's so much in there I don't wanna give up. Why are you making it so difficult? Shouldn't it be easy? Oh, okay, I hear that, I hear that. Well, do you get out and do you exercise? Do you, do you walk and do you enjoy the... No, there's so much on TV I love to watch. I don't want to give that up. This is the worst program ever. You should just take the weight from me. Why do you make it so hard? And, and some people relate to the church and they relate to God that way. They say, I want to be a better person. I, I want to relate in my relationships better. I want to have the peace to understand that despite all that's happening, that I have a purpose. Well, let me tell you, are, are you supporting with your prayers? Are you supporting those in ministry with your No, I don't. I don't have time for that kind of stuff. What about your presence? Do you come and are you active in it? Well, no, because I have other things to do on, on a pretty Sunday morning. That's, that's my time. Uh, do you support it with your gifts? Well, no, see, because that's all they want. They just want my money. Well, what about your witness? Well, people will think I'm a freak if I were to actually talk about that J word. But I, see, I don't get the church. It's not doing anything for me. What is the image that you have for your connection to who we are? And, and Jeff said it so well. I, I don't want members. Members are useless. I want partners. I want somebody that will take your hand and say, you can count on me and not disappear whenever something needs to be done. In Jeremiah chapter 17, I chose this image. I'm a big fan of images. I chose this image, and it should be on your card, because there is a choice that lies before you, whether you will choose life or choose barrenness. In Jeremiah chapter 17, 
Jeremiah writes, God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah. He says, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. Does that describe parts of your life? But he goes on to say, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree that is planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in years of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. Does that describe you? It could, you know. That's the offering that God gives to you, to bear fruit. Even in those moments of drought, when things look hard, you have confidence. But I want to share with you a story that Jesus told his disciples, because they felt, like everybody that was around them, they felt like they were all going to go to heaven, that it was all, because we're Jewish, we're on our way, we've got our ticket punched. And Jesus told it a little differently. He tells a story about an invitation. Have you ever been to a banquet or have been to a wedding reception? I mean, the kind of very formal affair where they send out a card because they say, will you attend? We, we need to plan. Will you attend? How many will be attending with you? And you, make a, uh, you send it back and say, yes, you can count on me. It was an invitation that was being sent so that a plan could make, be made. Now, Jesus tells a story about a banquet where people made a pledge. He's talking about the church and he's talking about the community where people made a pledge, but for some reason didn't follow up on it. This is a very troubling parable. And, and I struggled with it all week because it really hits a, a nerve uh, for me. And, it, and I'm hoping that in sharing and telling the story that it, it helps you a little bit understand what's happening. I want to kind of go back, and I need to give a little bit of background before we, we take on the passage from Luke 14. In the passage just prior to this, Jesus is sitting around with his disciples and friends, and they're having a dinner. And Jesus is saying, look, when you go to a dinner, don't, don't just go to the seat of, of privilege and power and authority. Take a seat with those that are sick and lame and poor, uh, that when the host comes, the host can then elevate you. Don't just assume that you are already a saint. That's essentially what he's saying. When a young man steps in and proclaims, won't it be fantastic when we all get the, the kingdom of God? Won't it be great when we all get to heaven? What a glorious day that will be when we all see Jesus, and Jesus says, wait a minute, not so fast. Listen to the story in Luke chapter 14. Now, one of those at the table with him heard this. He said to Jesus, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet, and he invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. Now the first one said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another one said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I am on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys and town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out in, 
to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. For I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Will you pray with me as we engage his word? Heavenly Father, your word challenges us, it, but it invites us to see our lives differently, not to just be hearers, but to be doers, to be livers, to help shape the community in which we live. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus tells this story. A young man comes and says, yes, but won't it be great when all of us get to heaven? And Jesus, I, I have this vision, Jesus, of looking out at, at, at the people that were speaking to him and said, you know, just feeling a heavy weight and said, it will not always be so. Not everybody will choose to come. And so he tells this story, this parable about a great banquet. And in ancient times, banquets were always held for weddings. People didn't have a lot of food, so they would not have just holiday banquets, but they would have wedding feasts because that was the beginning of a relationship, of a marriage. And so this is probably some kind of a wedding banquet, a, if you will, a reception out of a, out of, for a wedding. And invitations have already gone out. And people have responded because it tells us that the landowner or the, the host of the banquet goes out and says, go out and tell those who have already been invited. These people have already been invited and they have already responded when they come back. So the first thing that we want to understand about this parable is that it is a, it is a stewardship is for the invited, okay? If you're visiting with us or if you're not affiliated with the church, if you're not a part, you kind of really don't trust what's kind of going on, this is primarily, this parable is for those that have already made that covenant, have already made that commitment, have already responded to that invitation. There's a part of the people that say, you know, I want to live differently. There's something about what God is offering that I want to be a part of. And so stewardship is about what we do with what we have after we say we believe. You see, I want you to understand that partnership, at the very core of partnership, is the word trust. Why is it that in most churches around the country, on national average, most Christians give less than 2% to the church, to what they say they believe, primarily because they don't trust? They don't believe that offering to God their very best will reap the rewards that they're hoping for. And so they keep it for themselves, saying, I think it's better to invest in the stock market than it is to invest in the kingdom. As a result, we find that stewardship is about revealing what you truly believe, what's deep within your heart. Stewardship is that part of your life where God says, come, for the feast is ready. And the question is, is will you come? Have you ever had this idea? Well, oftentimes in, in Christian circles, we have this, we've got this skewed view of heaven and hell. And this idea that what's going to happen is when you die, you're going to come into the kingdom and God is going to separate and throw some people into damnation. What Jesus seems to be revealing here is when the feast is available and he says, please come, come to the feast, we will find excuses not to be a part of what is happening. Not just in the here and now, but in the there and then. You see, if you're having a difficult time connecting in, in your church, in your faith community, if you find it difficult to find your niche or it requires too much time and too many demands on your schedule, if you're struggling in the here and now, it's gonna be a struggle there and then. See, I don't believe that evil does not come to you where, with horns and a red cape, that it becomes obvious. Evil will always come in garb that represents exactly what you want in your life. Evil will give you exactly what your heart desires. Think about that for a minute. Stewardship is also for the distracted. We are so distracted by all the things that we could or should do. 
It comes to reveal everything that we've ever wanted in our lives, in this life. What evil does is it chains you to the earth, to bind you to the rat race in which we find ourselves. Nobody really says it better than a guy by the name of John Piper. John says it this way. Uh, let me see if I can get it. There we go. He says, the critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you could have heaven with no sickness, with all the friends that you ever had on earth and all the food you ever liked and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauty you ever saw and all the physical pleasures you ever tasted and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with a heaven like that? If Christ were not there, you see, most of the time when we think about what will heaven be like, we frame it in terms of everything that we're going to get out of it. Oh, it'll be great. It'll be everything you ever wanted and there'll be no sickness and everything. And what God is inviting us to is this great banquet where he is present. And each of these characters, each of these excuses is turning down an opportunity to be with the master of the banquet. It isn't that... It isn't that we are being thrown out. We choose not to attend. You see, stewardship simply says, will you partner? Will you participate? And the question is, is how will you respond? What will we do if Christ is not there? Now, have you ever heard the phrase, that's a pretty lame excuse? What does that mean? It means basically a lame excuse is an excuse that is so flimsy as to be unbelievable. What about this? What about a laming excuse? What is a laming excuse? It's an excuse that becomes part of who you are that almost makes you crippled because you believe it so deeply that it prevents you from living the life that you were intended to live. And look at all of these laming excuses. The first person comes up and says, hey, I have land. Now, a landowner was somebody with power and privilege and had status. And as a result, they say, I don't need that kind of thing. I understand that you need to go to church. I know that you have spiritual needs that you have to deal with, but I've got the, I've got the world by the horns, right? I don't need that kind of stuff. My 401k is doing great. I have insurance. What else could I possibly need? I have land, I need to go check it out. That is a status excuse. There's another guy that comes and says, but I've got oxen and I want to go try them out. I just got a new toy. It's a beautiful day. I've got some toys that I'd love to play with. I've got some things that I want to do. I've got places that I want to go. It's all about their possessions. What are the toys? What are the competitions? What are the other things that are demanding your attention? And finally, there's a guy that doesn't go for religious reasons. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, it tells you that a young married couple was given a year off from any military or civic duties in order that they could get to know one another. They could work on their relationship. And so this young person comes and says, well, I don't have to participate. I don't have to be a part of what God is doing because I've always been there. I always have my pew ready for me. And I have my hymnal and that's all that there really is to it. I go through the motions, right? I don't really want to know the master. I just want to go through the legalism. And the question is, is for us, is do we have a sense of a laming excuse? But ultimately, it tells us that stewardship is for those that are intentional. If you want to grow, if you want to be challenged, if you want each year to be better than the last, then it's about doing what you know to be right. Wisdom is knowing the right path, but integrity is taking it, is making the conscious decision. Each of you should have received an invitation, a stewardship card to say, what is it you believe? The reason that I do that is so that I get that burden off of me. See, I wanna be in a position where when I meet Jesus, I don't have to say, why didn't you invite them? They were invited. 
You all are invited to a deeper life. The question that I leave with you is how you choose to respond to it. What you want to do with what God has already given in your life. Stewardship asks, who's in control of your life? Who's in control? One of the great things that I shared at the early service, sometimes I don't know that you fully grasp how unique this church is, how unique your spirituality is. I, if I ch- seem like I'm challenging, it's just simply to help you grow. But this place is as unique as any that I have encountered. Over the past couple of months, I've learned about the history about how this church has evolved and how there used to be a little white church that sat just over here. And I I asked the ladies out here in the narthex to put up a poster so that you can see the history of this church as it has unfolded. There used to be a little white church over here and years ago, somehow, which I'm not really clear about, a decision was made to say, we need to leave our little white church And we need to build something bigger for more people because we feel God is going to do something. We don't know what, we don't know how or why, but he's going to do something. There's a movement, there's an energy. We need to leave our little building in order to embrace something bigger. And everything that we have here, everything that you're sitting on is a gift from them, is a part of their legacy. And what's unique about this is that so often what happens in churches is they transfer their allegiance from God, who is a blessing to all of us, to the building itself. And, and there's a temptation for all of us to worship our pews and our hymnals and the surroundings. But for some reason, which I'm still studying and still learning about, you chose to leave that because of a bigger faith, a bigger vision And that permeates all that you say and do. And I can hear it and I can see it in the way you interact with one another. It changes how you relate to one another. So here's the bottom line. Stewardship is preparation that is driven by anticipation. We anticipate something happening in the future. We look to the future. I want my life I want to impact this world in the light of the next. People that gave and served for this place did so because they were looking to the future. They were looking to where it would go. The question that stewardship is all about is what is it that we believe? What is our vision? What is our hope for the future? I can't help but end this morning with a, with a, hint, with a, a verse from uh, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says it very simply. He said, if you aim for heaven, you will get earth thrown in. If you aim for earth, you will get neither. If you aim for the things and the pleasures of this life, you will neither get that or the satisfaction of the heaven that is to come, the joy that is to come. If you're so satisfied with the toys, with the power, with the privilege, you will always turn down the invitation Come, follow me. If you offer yourself to God, you will not only get heaven given to you, but all of your possessions will take on a new, deeper meaning. Stewardship is not about getting anything from you. It's about offering to you a different way of seeing your life and your your experiences, your world. So the question that lies before all of us When we come, you have been given an invitation to something bigger. How will you respond to that invitation? The ultimate thing is, this is a church where it's not just a place you go, it's about who you become. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of your word as it transforms us and makes us come alive. Help us, Father, to respond to your invitation and to share joyfully all that you've already given to us in Jesus name. Amen.